Thank you. Don't get too comfortable. I've watched you for half an hour sitting and looking at your phone. Can we stand up for one second, please? <laughs> do not hate me. This will feel amazing when you're done, trust me. We're just going to do a little shake out. I do this with the three kids at home. It helps them. So just start shaking out your hands and then start giving yourself a bit of round of applause and just clap faster, 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 faster. And shake it out. Thank you so much. We can now talk about data and security and not be too frustrated by the energy flowing in the room. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time today to come and see me. We will discuss what security means and also why it is that no longer we can put our data and our personal stuff into what's known as glass boxes. Um, who's had a call recently saying, hi, can we ask you a couple of questions if you want to apply for a credit card? Ooh, Matt has. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, a, it's a way of accessing service in exchange for our data, and that goes for everything, whether you're in front of an airport, in front of a security person, in front of a bank. As human beings, we ask for services, and what do we hear? That's fine. Give us some data, and we might make a decision to say yes or no. So why is this important? In defining security, we can no longer talk about this is a box either made of glass, which you've just seen it is, nothing's unhackable, or it's a box stamped confidential. We promise we will not look inside it. How do you know? Well, you don't. And so as data scientists, what we look at is how to better manage and secure our data. And I, of course, there's three patterns now on this topic, both in the US and here in Europe. And I'm obsessed with figuring out how to make a world better for at least one of my three children not to be exposed in this way. Now, when we go and access services in a bank or in an airplane, that's all right. We as adults, we go and travel, we do these things. This is possibly a risk we're worth taking. But when you go online and find childcare, that's a huge vulnerability. We don't know where their data goes, what their data is. We don't know who we're letting into our own homes. Cleaners are found online. As you've seen, dating is online. Childcare is what really got to me many years ago, and I thought, I have got to sort this out. So what we do at VJ now, and I said the old company name, we've just rebranded, what we do at Zamna is we actually create trust in data, and we separate these two things. And if you remember nothing else from today, please remember this. In the modern world, you do not have to have data in order to be able to trust it. I'll say this again. Today, you have got to give your data for someone to say, I trust you. You can have access to X, Y, Z. In the future, you will not need to do this. That is the really clever bit of what we do. We separate trust from the data. And in solving this, we cannot become Big Brother. We can't say, let's just put a giant glass box with everyone's data in the middle and create some sort of trusted algorithms. I gave an example earlier of Matt getting a call saying, would you like to apply for a credit card? Where does that data go? Who compares it? Today, I take your data as a middle person from bank A, I take your data from bank B. I hold it together and make some magic happen. Then I can sell it on to the highest bidder. We cannot create little brothers or big brothers, and especially not when we talk about government security agencies, passenger data in an airline context, and border control. You cannot have this happen. Today when you fly, you will be stopped for a passport check up to 10 times when you go through an airport. In fact, they will stop you if you've connected from one flight on the same airline on the same day. Everyone loves it when someone says, excuse me, sir, madam, can you just stop and get this paper book out and we can look at it critically and assess that you are who you say you are. The reason this is done today is because there is no way to digitally trust that whatever your last check was in the last airline can be trusted by the next airline. There's no way that an airline doing all this hard work to check that your data is correct, that you're allowed to get on a plane, a very vulnerable situation, hundreds of people in confined space being jetted across the world. They're trying to make risk assessments on you as well they should, both as airlines and as governments, to say, yes, you can access the service of flying on a plane and come to your country of destination. But the process is broken. From a data science perspective, there is no way that all this hard work an airline does and a government does, all of that cannot be put in the service of the next check. This is why today, tomorrow, and in the near future, when you fly, you will notice they will repeat them. They will stop you again. 
They will manually have to look at you and scrutinize your face and decide whether you're a threat or not. So in the context of trust and data, I would like to share how we solve this for governments, airlines, and security agencies, and why there are five principles, which I'd like to leave with you today, five principles of what we think is the best way of getting it right when you think for your organizations how to approach secure data storage, management, and building trust in that data set. So the separation of trust and data is not an easy task. What we ultimately do is we are able to recognize data at Zamna without knowing what the data is. I'll say that again. You're able to recognize someone who's at your door and knocking on your door without having to have a copy of a picture of them or having a copy of any of their information. Until today, this was not possible. And this is indeed why we spent the last half a decade with the team at Zamna creating this IP that enables us to do that. The first technical principle we used is doing away with open data. As you've just seen from the previous talk, open data is very vulnerable. When we talk about obfuscated data, though, there are many levels of doing that. There are some ways that are kind of like one-way systems. You can't get back from that. How many in the room are familiar with hashing? A handful. It's a fancy way of saying, put something in, get a string of gibberish out. If anyone tells you different, they're lying. Blockchain, in essence, is a bunch of their gibberish connected to each other like dominoes. Who understands what blockchain does here in the room? Keep your hand up if you can explain it in a second. Ah. It's just like the domino effect. You tap one, all the others fall down, and then you know this is compromised. Again, if anyone else tells you it's any more complex than that, it's not true. The data connectivity between these bits is actually really critical because what that gives you is the way of saying, did someone tap that domino and did it impact this one? Or has it been not tampered with in the state of integrity that it was originally? And is that data set complete? So when we talk about obfuscated data, a lot of the time you'll hear hashing is super safe. It actually wasn't safe enough for what Zamna had to do with airline data. Because if you think about hashing, there's a way of creating a bunch of smart things, such as a very simple dictionary attack, those in the room are familiar with it, but you can actually create a library and then try and guess what the data says, and you're nodding, this is true. Any kind of one-way function, you can still guess what the underlying information is. So when we're obfuscating data, we're using 500 odd steps beyond hashing to actually make sure it really is one way. So there's a lot of things you can do and layer best practices, best cryptography approaches, best obfuscation tools that you can find. There's a lot of technology out there that can do that very, very effectively so that no data is exposed necessarily. Now, privacy by design is a term that's being bandied about. It's a tw Article 27 of GDPR, which we've all heard about in the room from the annoying emails that we've got saying, please subscribe to whatever. Now, privacy by design says we can no longer put data in boxes and stack them as confidential and then build really high walls around them. Privacy by design says you have got to build systems that from the outset are secure, don't need walls around them, and are designed in a way that you cannot expose anything, even if you have insider threats. So somebody in your organization starts trying to access these data points. Privacy by design architecture firms are popping up everywhere. They're doing assessments. They're helping people understand whether their architecture is secure enough. And again, you've seen what happens in the talk just before me when privacy by design is not the case. For us at Zamna, not only privacy by design was important, but obviously also not keeping this data set, no matter how obfuscated, in one place. When we talked about access to services today, all of the enterprises that we interact with very likely have central corporate data warehouses. We've seen enough stories every single day, this week, last week, in the last few years, and in a post-Cambridge Analytica world, we know how powerful it is if someone gets hold of that data in a single centralized place and puts it to use in a nefarious context. So in a decentralized world, can you then apply this practice in your organization and say, right, we're going to not have it all here, we're going to put a bit over here, a bit over here, a bit over there. We're going to use a different principle of managing this data. We're going to make sure that the di distributed way that we work, and indeed at Zamna, this is what we do, 
there is no way that at any one point all of this data set can be compromised. Which leads me on to the next point. The access all areas is actually very powerful. If you run an organization which is using any data, even if that data is distributed or decentralized, there can be an inherent vulnerability if somebody has the right to say, right, let's just look at all of this. So we went through our pen testing process several times over, over years and years and years, and someone tried to break us. Now, this is part of becoming a supplier to IAG, who own five airlines, including Iberia, Welling, and British Airways, amongst others. And they really tried to break us. And as data scientists, we loved it. And they said, we can break. We can break Xamna. This is great. And I said, great. How long will it take you to break Xamna? And they said, well, according to our latest calculations, if you wanted to break into just one data set on Xamna, anyone want to guess how long it would take? 1 million to 10 million years. So nothing's unhackable, but it would take you a long time. Now, this is because the way we built our architecture and our solution, which again has got to satisfy secure government airlines and the agencies that are checking all of the sensitive data, we've made sure that there is no single point of compromise, not just for external threat, but for ourselves as well. It would take one to 10 million years for me as CEO of Zamna to get into anything on our system as well. And that's a double bind. When we first started this company, we were asked by a lot of very senior people, oh, this is a great business model. You can take copies of all these people's passports and sell them on. Data is more valuable than oil. And they couldn't believe that in the original articles of Association of Companies House, in our articles as to how the directors behave and treat data, it precluded us from not just selling the data, but actually managing open data, seeing it, or being exposed to it in any way. So the way we solve this with our clients is we actually hand over our software into the client environment, into their secure spaces. They integrate it as a plug and play black box, but then they're able to send us that gibberish that means nothing to anyone, even if you're really, really clever, and you can jump in and attack and get a copy of that gibberish. And it's that magical signal that we then use in the service of rechecking the data. So at no point can someone say, we've compromised the entire data set and someone has access to it. And finally, not just keeping the data set secure, but also how do you answer the question, can I trust it? How can you trust that your bank today knows whether to issue with a service of a credit card? Anyone venture a guess what percentage of assurance the financial industry on average has that your identity is correct? What percentage do you think they know that this is you they're checking? Shut up, it's a small one. 95 is too high, it's lower than 95. Any guesses? 50, 75. Almost, 75 is the closest. Higher than 50, it's more than a flip of a coin for a bank, it's about 80%. So actually, one in five times, they will do a credit check on the wrong person. And that's just the process as it is today. We don't have a better way as yet, even though the technology is now available, to start having a data set that is not just accurate, but can be trusted by multiple parties, because we're talking about data between enterprises, whether it's governments and airlines, or bank to bank, or anywhere else that you're talking about data in this context. There has currently been no way up till now for the data to be trusted to be correct and of high integrity, and that means any other check you perform on that mistrusted, potentially incorrect data is also compromised. When we talk to governments, and I've just been in Washington DC last week, when we talk to government agencies, currently they're at the mercy of the airlines providing them with accurate data. In fact, they make it the airline's problem to check all of us. The airline doesn't care what our data is. They care that we've paid for a seat on their flying bus. That's all they care about. What the government of departure and destination cares about is one of the 17 different spellings of the name Mohammed. If you happen to be the wrong Mohammed and you're on a watch list, that is very, very significant. If that data is incorrect, and we established that 50% of passenger data had some form of mistakes in it, this is an official figure now adopted 
by the World's Airline Trade Association, if the data can't be trusted, not just by multiple parties, but by one, then anything you do on top of it as a government agency makes no sense. If you have a watch list of names, the watch list does not exist. It's rubbish in, rubbish out. No more than that. So not having a single point of trust is really the key things that Xamna solves. With our decentralized system, that's what we provide to our airlines and government agencies as a capability to establish. And remember the first point we made and the only thing I asked you to remember is there is a way now to separate trust from data. Our clients can recognize whether data is trusted without having a copy of that data set. And this is mission critical. You can recognize that you've seen a passenger 20 times over. You don't have to have a copy of their data. So key takeaways to consider. One, open data versus obfuscated. Number two, is your system privacy by design and is your architecture secure? Three, the move from centralized data sets to distributed and decentralized data sets. Number four, no single point of compromise, both externally and inside the organization. And number five, and very, very critical, no single point of trust. I'll be happy to take some questions outside later. Thank you so much for your time today. Have a great day.